Okay, so hi everyone. We're going to talk with Samar about uh, productionizing workers. Uh, I think Samar has some uh, a lot of experience, at, at least at Uber. I don't, I don't know if you want to start this off with any fun stories that, from from like Uber, or you want to go straight into the productionizing topic. <laughs> so, um, I think in general, I don't have uh, like a specific story from the Uber days, but in I can give you the basic principle when we were building this system, what was the goal that we were hoping to strive? Um, so one of uh, like temporal provides all sorts of primitives for building applications. But at the end of the day, the thing that we take pride on essentially is the reliability that people get out of the platform when they are building their applications on top of it. So at least when we started this effort, even back at Uber, the idea was build a system which uh, when things go wrong, uh, people trust you enough where they the way they reach out to you is, can you please help us debug problems in our application? Because they already have built enough trust in the system that, oh, like if things are going wrong, maybe it's because there is something that they are doing incorrectly and or they are misusing the system and they would reach out to us essentially to help us find problems in their application. And one of the things that I feel really happy about is I felt like we were able to establish that trust even back at Uber days where things when things will go wrong as a majority of the time it will turn out to be issues on the application side uh, which we would help our users to debug and pinpoint those application errors. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so we'll get right into the, the topics that we prepared uh, because I want to uh, get right to the points. So we prepared five broad categories. Um, so this is everything after you're done developing, shipping temporal code or temporal, uh, yeah, temporal empowered application into production. Uh, so the five categories are visibility, uh, incident response, tooling, uh, upgrading and testing failure paths. Uh, and they may not all be the same order. Uh, so shall we touch on visibility first? Yeah, absolutely. So any like when, whenever people are building applications, um, one of the awesome things about building applications on top of Temporal is um, you have this awesome one box or your developer setup where you, you can just have everything run on your laptop and then you can just keep on developing against it without um, like thinking about other concerns. And I think, uh, by the way, thanks to, uh, I think Datadog, right? Who uh, recently contributed the temporal light and it, we keep Super. on improving and make it even better and better uh, to easily get started and build applications locally on your developer machines on top of temporal. Um, so, but I think the, and this thing completely turns around the moment you have your application built and now you are running it in production, how do you know whether if your ap application is doing its job or even it's running as expected? So this is where I think we, uh, at least on both our client SDKs and even the server, we emit a lot of metric, uh, or, uh, which gives insights into the, how, how your application is working and performing. Um, and we have all sorts of counters uh, uh, and latency metric and error metric, uh, which helps us get that visibility holistically once you start running that application in production at a large scale. So one of the things that I definitely recommend people to do is first of all, when they are running metric uh, on their application workers and even starters, uh, make sure you um, correctly set up uh, the uh, metric. Um, uh, like um, we have an API where you can set up your metric scope, where you can hook up your application to whatever ingestion or uh, telemetry system that you are using within your company. So make sure to do that integration. And if by chance you are using uh, Prometheus or Grafana, we actually provide dashboards uh, to our users uh, where they can just uh, easily get started by importing those dashboards and then they get some basic visibility into your uh, workload out of the box. And the same thing, by the way, like on the server, 
um, B emits all sorts of metric uh, from the server. Some metric are about the health of the server, but some metric are tagged with namespaces, which provide interesting uh, information about how a particular workload is doing for a specific namespace. So, and then we provide uh, um, like few dashboards, which helps us get level of visibility for the server operator also. And today that actually works using, um, we use this library by the name of Tally, which uh, plugs in very nicely with Prometheus, Tads T, and actually another open source um, uh, um, M3 server by the name of M3. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, so I think there are adopters, which just it uh, plugs right in. So you should be able to use that with any of those backends. Uh, but we actually are doing a lot of investments on moking, uh, uh, moving over to open telemetry. And then we will plug, uh, have the ability to plug in into a much more wider uh, uh, metric backends in the future. Awesome. And these metrics, uh, what do you recommend alerting on? So, uh, so let's start with the user um, application side of things, that metric on the client side. So as part of your payload, I think there is a lot of metric. Uh, there are some metric around, let's say, start with activities. So it gives you metric around, uh, uh, which is tagged by the activity types and the task queues. Um, so you want to make sure, are your activities working as expected? How many activities are getting started? How many activities are completing successfully? And uh, if there are any activities which are failing, which and you might want to alert on activity failure rate, essentially, uh, for your application. So you can get all of that done by just the activity set of metrics that we emit on the client side. Same thing goes for um, your workflow tasks, um, where essentially, like um, as your workflows are making forward progress and new events are happening, uh, the way it works with temporal is we will dispatch a workflow task to your worker. And then that workflow task ends up uh, resulting into your worker picking it up and calling your application logic to figure out the next set of commands that needs to happen for your workflow execution. So um, your workflow, how, at what rate your workflow tasks are happening? And if your workflows are making forward progress, like what is the latency? How much it's taking for a particular workflow task? Or if your workflow tasks are completing successfully or not. So you can get all of that insight through those metrics also. Another key area I highly recommend you should set up uh, alerts on is workflow task failure rates. And workflow tasks can fail for all sorts of reasons. One of the things that maybe you have a panic in your application. So a panic typically causes your application to crash and lose all your state, but with temporal, like workloads never fail. So even those panic means that we will keep on failing those workflow tasks. Um, so certain kind of bugs, which uh, applications today treat as transient failures. Um, the definition of transient failure for temporal also includes your uh, application bugs also, anything that you can fix with a deployment is a trans transient failure when it comes to a workload running on top of Temporal. So uh, basically um, having alerts on workflow task failure rate might be very critical for you to make sure your application is running and is healthy. Uh, another interesting one, which I, I always recommend people is uh, around which comes around scale. Let's say if your workers are not uh, provisioned uh, with enough capacity which means that um, the way it gets surfaced to your application is we have a metric called uh, activities scheduled to start and workflow scheduled to start essentially. And we uh, highly recommend people to kind of make sure um, that they um, create an alert on schedule to start latency metric and they use it to basically scale their uh, worker fleet based on that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a separate scaling discussion, but that is the core recommendation there um, for uh, for schedule to start latency, and we document that fairly well. Um, okay, so that was the health or sort of health topic. Uh, shall we move on to incident response or how to pinpoint the problem? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so yeah, so I think having all of this metric ingested and having your dashboards to give you that level of visibility, at least now you can start getting uh, overall picture of what's going on with the system. Um, another then once let's say um, your uh, workflow task failure rate starts going up. Um, there could be many reasons essentially, uh, which could result into workflow task failing. Um, so typically at, um, I think the first thing an operator wants to do is they need to figure out how to decouple or find out whether the failure rate is because of an application versus something going wrong on the temporal server. So I, I think the whenever you see some kind of a failure rate, I would highly recommend that look at the error. Uh, we have a metric like service request and service error metrics, which is emitted by the server. So the first thing you want to do is like, do you see any error on the server itself? So you want to make sure that the server is healthy because if the server is healthy and then you are seeing uh, your workflow tasks failing or uh, workflows failing or activities failing, then it's, it's a good data point uh, where, which means that you should focus your uh, investigation and um, are at least starting the, uh, the focus of your investigation from the application side rather than the server. So, over there, I think the most critical tool for you, first of all, look at the logs, make sure the logs are in a place where they are available for um, and any operator. Um, because, and it should be part of your checklist also that logs are stored and captured somewhere, emitted on the worker side. And amid, most of our logs, if you're seeing some errors, you will see that our logs are tagged with uh, things like workflow type, activity type, uh, workflow IDs, run IDs. So we uh, try to put as much information as tags, which allows you to filter those or uh, slice and dice those uh, logs on certain on those criteria. So um, typically, let's say, let's pick a scenario. Let's if your workflow tasks are failing. So and if you have uh, access to your logs, you should be able to quickly identify. Oh, is it a uh, one workflow? Maybe it's just one type of workflow failing. And then you should uh, you should be able to quickly identify essentially uh, if it's a bug in which workflow type, and uh, even uh, within a workflow type, uh, what is the workflow ID and run ID of that workflow? The moment you kind of capture that data, uh, I would highlight then another tool which will be super useful for you is either Temporal Web or CLI. Because now once you have at least a sample of few workflow IDs and run IDs, then you want to make sure you can look at workflow state. Uh, what is the state of that workflow? What is the execution history of that workflow? Because typically those are very good data points, uh, which will start providing you more information about how to debug your failures. If let's say now, let's say the reason your workflows are failing is because you have a panic in your system or your workflows are panicking because of a bug. Um, the moment you get history, access to history, you will see uh, we um, bubble up those failures or record those failures as part of the history as workflow task failed event. So using in the workflow task failed event, you will have not only have the actual failure, but the entire call stack of that failure captured. Um, so this way, at least you can basically, you can figure out which workflow and at least get the first level of information. Oh, here's a call stack of my workflow, which is continuously failing. Uh, another awesome thing, which you want to make sure you can, you set up, uh, as part of your operationalizing your workload is, uh, we provide this anytime a failure workflow failure happens in production. It is hundred um, uh, percent like you. Uh, you can replay it. Uh, all you need to do is like download the history of that workflow execution, and you can do that using CLI or web. 
and then you can replay that workflow under a debugger on your local machine from the history and then you can step through your code and then you can actually figure out where the failure is yeah i really want to have a video just focusing on that because uh that makes so much sense but i don't know how to do it i haven't i haven't tried it myself so yeah it's uh, a very powerful feature and i 100% agree i think we should document it and we should actually <laughs> provide much better tooling where people can easily debug live production workflows under a debugger on their machines yeah it really teaches you how to pull works as well because you can tie the event to the SD sdk api call uh, which is also nice Awesome, but I think uh, I, I just picked one uh, use case, but I think it just gives you a basic um, like philosophy, how like debugging your workload when things fail essentially. Yeah, we, uh, we basically trace, you know, we implement distributed tracing for you. So. And sorry, I didn't <laughs> cover that. Yeah, so I think that's like <laughs> another thing. It's like we already provide support for tracing essentially and which uh, the, Typically with distributed tracing um, for microservices, it's like uh, you can chase a call and then you can trace it across different systems. But with temporal, essentially, just imagine it is so powerful. Let's say if you have a long running workflow, we provide mechanism where we have these distributed trace emitted for, for the entire lifetime of a single workflow execution. And I think that support is already provided by our SDKs. And then if you do integration with Jaeger or other distributed uh, tracing mechanisms, you should get that level of visibility where once you pinpoint a problem, you can actually dive deeper and then you can chase the entire lifetime of a single workflow execution. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's the ultimate solution for pinpointing uh, problems. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else? Shall we move on to tooling? I think that is... Uh, um, on tooling, uh, as I think this covers pretty much like uh, make sure metric and dashboards are set up, your alerts, we covered that. We covered essentially uh, logs, make sure you have access to the logs um, because it uh, actually also helps us a lot when you are filing, actually find bugs in either the SDKs or the server. I think having access to those logs and attaching those as part of bug reports will be super useful. Finding your workflow execution histories uh, and then ability to replay them. Got it. Yep, it, it covers it as well. I got nothing else to add there. Okay. Um, okay, so the last two for the deploy checklist is upgrading and testing failure paths. Uh, let's talk about upgrading first. Yeah, so one, um, okay. So I think one of the things is, um, one of the tricky areas about workflows, uh, or like temporal workflows is, now you are managing state for an application which lives for a relatively longer period of time. So if you have a bug in your application, essentially, how do you patch already uh, or workflow execution which are already in flight? So Temporal essentially provides um, this very nice API, uh, get version API, which allows you to patch um, live workflow executions uh, after the fact. Um, but at the same time, it's that API, you need to be very careful with that API because it comes with its own set of challenges essentially. Um, because now it, we are giving you a, a ability where um, we will take certain parts of the code depending on uh, when that workflow was started and what was the last time or which version of the code that workflow made progress with when it uh, uh, when an event happened on it the last time. Um, so as part of upgrades, um, one of the restrictions uh, in general, uh, Temporal uh, pro, uh, enforces on any workflow logic is they need to be deterministic, which means any time you are making changes to your workflow logic, you are breaking um, uh, determinism rule essentially. So which means this is where the get version API is handy because now it allows you to make changes to your workflow logic in a deterministic fashion. Um, there, there's a bit of nuance to this in the sense that if, it, if you're making changes to logic that hasn't reached, uh, ha hasn't been reached yet, it's fine. <laughs> 
right? It's only the logic that has already happened that you, that if if you're making changes to the past, then you need to flag it. Yeah, but that's but you cannot predict that, right? So when you are looking at the code, you don't know you have like yeah. hundreds of thousands of workflow executions running, and they each of those are in different <laughs> stages of your implementation, right? So, but yes. then th this is what the get version API provides you is where you can now make changes to your workflow logic, and then you can handle all case all uh, like all of those existing whether it is before the point that bug uh, has reached or maybe it's after the point the bug has reached, and then you can you can solve all of those things with the get version API. So, but the key point that I want to get to is like making sure that you don't break determinism guarantees. It's um, we provide a lot of, uh, I think that replay uh, functionality that I was talking about earlier is an awesome primitive where you should be check, uh, checking in certain work, uh, samples of your workflow execution histories in different stages. And then you can use the same replay API to make sure uh, you are not violating determinism. Uh, guarantee when you are iterating over or making changes to your uh, workflow logic. And in, in my opinion, that is also part of your checklist to have a compliance suite, which allows you to make sure you can make changes to your workflow logic without breaking determinism. So yeah, that is- I, I think we need on, more demos of that. Yeah, yeah, so on upgrades, essentially, that's why I'm saying like, um, for seamless up upgrades, essentially, uh, making sure be the, any changes to the workflows are backwards compatible, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For anyone using the TypeScript SDK, we have a different version of the versioning API called patching, uh, and we're yeah. still so, but iterating I think, on that. So the key thing is making changes to your workflow logic. Make sure um, you think through your strategy because there are get version is one strategy which is available. There are even other strategies where maybe some people, they create a new task queue for the new version of the code, which is gets deployed. And then they keep, they keep the old worker running and then drain all workflow executions. If you are no, your workflow executions are short-lived, then you don't need to use that version. You just, every time you make changes, you create a new task queue and then you keep your old ones alive until all workloads are drained. And then you just get rid of the old worker queue essentially. Got so then, then this, this is making me solve for you automatically. Uh, this is making me think of uh, we should have a workshop just for versioning, just for getting people to practice different situations and getting them familiar with like, because the main thing that I have to teach people or the main thing that makes people scared to do this is that they don't know what breaks determinism. They're not used to thinking about that, right? Because yeah. it never used to matter. Um, so we have to teach people and show them, you know, here's the safe Agreed. example. Here's not safe. Agreed. So, but this is something people typically realize after they've run, put the system in production. <laughs> and, the first, and then the first, time they make, the, the first time they make the change and then they break stuff. Uh, but it break in a safe way, right? Like the people will not proceed beyond and like a certain exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. good point. So by the way, if even, I think that is one of the things with Temple, it allows you to move fast. Okay. It's okay. Like ideally you don't break things in production, but even in this case, let's say if you create a bug, your workflows are still there. And then we will keep and you roll back your deployment and then magically all of the workflows which were stuck will start making forward progress. Yeah. Yeah. Like our worst case is that we just don't progress. Like that, that's basically it. Like yeah. You can fix it uh, as, when you notice it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, that's for upgrading. Uh, but uh, fixing and noticing it the key. So make sure you have your alert set up on workflow task failures, essentially, which will <laughs> give you that. Should we, uh, do we uh, condone deploying on Fridays? Uh, or, or is that, uh, is there a rule against that? <laughs> if you don't like who's on call, then probably. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. But we should okay. not, uh, never deploy on Friday, yes. Uh, uh, there's some uh, very uh, observability people that says it's a, it's a good practice. You should trust your systems enough to warn you so that you can deploy on Fridays. I don't want to get in the middle of that. It's a, it's a hot topic okay. uh, in the industry. Uh, okay, so uh, last part is testing fail, failure, failure paths. Uh, and this is around um, thinking through edge uh, error cases and edge cases, right? Something like that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so a lot of people, they'll code for happy paths and, uh, what happens 
with the unhappy past. I don't even know what that specifically means. So if you want I can to give you that. a very good example, by the way. And uh, once okay. again, as part of your plan, when you are putting things in production, um, so um, I one of the examples that I can, uh, I can think of from my past experience is um, always uh, test your system for backlogs. And uh, when what I mean by backlog is sometimes in your logic workflow uh, logic, people write code. Um, they create timer A, uh, timer, let's say for uh, one second, and then create another timer for one hour. Um, and then, of course, someone could make an assumption and very fair assumption. Oh, that timer that I'm seg- uh, setting for one second will fire before uh, the one hour one. And it's very natural when you are writing code, essentially. That assumption could break when you start thinking when- about temporal. Temporal could go down itself, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, or your workers, even server is there, server is firing, but your workers are offline. Let's say your workers are down for one hour. So, which means that, but server is running and then server will have both the one second timer fired and one hour timer fired event in the history. And the next workflow task that happens will include both of those events. So, from the application logic, it might happen, it could trigger paths some uncertain paths in your application where it would look like the one hour timer uh, fired at the same uh, or before your one second one. So this is where I highly recommend test your system for backlogs because backlog uh, testing a system for backlogs will force um, these kind of basically edge cases, which could arrive, um, creep up in your workflow implementations. Are you saying with our test suite or with some kind of end-to-end thing? Um, not test suite. I'm not talking uh, like as, as an integration, as an end-to-end, make yeah. sure you are testing your system uh, where let's say you run your workload, then you shut down your worker. Yeah for some time and then which by nature it will create backlog of workflow tasks. Okay. Okay. And now uh, when you have this backlog of workflow tasks, now you run spin up your workers again, which will churn through that backlog of workflow tasks essentially. Got it. So I think these kind of backlog scenarios, first of all, it will help you kind of, um, uh, fig- like find all of these edge cases that I was talking about around timers firing at unexpected um, like um, manner. It will also be super useful from capacity planning because when the system is under uh, backlog, typically the resource consumption uh, characteristics of, of both the server and potentially your uh, app worker applications could be, be very different than when it's operating under normal circumstances. So always making sure you are doing capacity planning, accounting for use cases where the system is under heavy load or backlog, which will help you think through utilization or, or do capacity planning correctly. Yep. Okay. Uh, we, we have a programmatic worker APIs that uh, let people do that. But I did not discover that until I worked on the text code SDK. This is one of those things that you only discover <laughs> once you really explore every single API. Um, so we need better documentation on that as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest. I actually thought this was, this topic was more about uh, handling errors, like uh, handling, like, you know, when you, when you, when you're done retrying, like make sure you making, making sure you catch, capture errors, obviously go as a language by, by design forces you to handle errors, but also like sometimes the errors are just ignored or like they're rethrown without any commentary. I don't know if you have any best practices around that, that sort of thing. So is it about like error handling on the application itself or error handling essentially in general, or like about uh, the- uh, most mostly for the temporal specific side of things, right? The, the application side, uh, we can let uh, 
developers handle it, but like anything that they sh- they should know when developing with. In my opinion, the key thing is timeouts, and this is an area, especially with temporal, that I see a lot. Is temporal uh, on one side um, provides different lots of knobs or uh, ability uh, ways where you can configure timeout for both activities and workflows. So at one side, it is uh, provides lots of abilities or it is very flexible, but at the same time, it causes essentially an area where if someone does not understand them correctly, then they can make mistakes also. So I think in general, like, and this is where timeouts and retry policies. My recommend, this is an area which I highly, highly recommend. Make sure you explicitly test for those um and um do not make assumptions around those ones essentially Expli- make sure explicitly cover those through unit test and integration test and even through backlog and then try those things out essentially oh it's a lot of testing oh my god yeah. okay got it got it uh okay uh, hey uh i i realized that we went over but uh this is really good at least to get it down on uh, recording and then I can turn it into a blog post or, or something. But I appreciate your time and uh, thanks for awesome. joining me on this. Okay, thanks okay. a lot, Sean, for doing it.